there may not be any public questions, but I recommend that we, we co collect together all public questions because my expectation is that most public questions and comments following presentations will be on the upcoming presentation. So we will, we will, I will ask for public comment uh, at the end of that presentation. I'm, I'm uh, Kerry Harbour, if you could please introduce the last speaker for the evening, uh, Gerald Strickland. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So as you mentioned, our next uh, public, uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, our director of nuclear projects, Gerald Strickland. And uh, Gerald has held various leadership roles in uh, engineering and uh, has over 30 years experience and is a registered professional civil engineer. And uh, Gerald, it's all yours to discuss our used fuel management. Good evening. Welcome. I'd like to thank you for inviting me to speak to you tonight. As Kerry noted, uh, this is the start of my 35th year with PG&E. And that, You're not uh, old enough for that. And most of that time has been associated with Diablo. So I have been actively involved with Diablo since before we uh, went into our commercial license. So a lot of history with it. I also had the uh, honor of um, being able to be intimately involved in the development of our dry cast storage program from the inception through the first two loading campaigns. So I do have a fairly good background. I always like to start my presentations with a photo, so I figured tonight uh, I wouldn't be any different. And that uh, this photo shows uh, a beautiful shot of our uh, central coast. In it, you can see clearly marked the uh, Unit 1 containment structure and the Unit 2 containment structure and the fuel handling building behind it. What you don't see marked is uh, inland about a half a mile at 300 feet above sea level is our independent spent fuel storage installation. A lot of people don't know that uh, Unit 1 and Unit 2 have separate operating licenses. That uh, Unit 1 is, is licensed to operate until 2024. Unit 2 is licensed to operate until 2025. And the independent spent fuel storage installation has a separate license. Many of the nuclear facilities use what's called a general license to be able to develop their spent fuel storage program. We elected to go with a site-specific license. And as such, that license uh, runs for a 20-year period and expires in 2024. Diablo Canyon uh, continues to safely produce about uh, 2,300 megawatts of power, good enough for about 3 million people in central and northern California. We uh, continue to produce about 20% of PG&E's overall power. What you see here is our uh, spent fuel pool. And that uh, every 18 to 20 months, we uh, move into a refueling outage, such as the one that we're in with Unit 1 at this point. During a refueling outage, we go through and do um, a series of maintenance steps within the plant, and we upgrade a number of systems. Also along with that, we replace a percentage of the fuel that's in the reactor. So effectively, every refueling outage, we remove about a third of the fuel, uh, which is 64, 65 fuel assemblies, and replace it with new fresh fuel. Fuel is is good for three cycles, which is approximately five years before it is uh, no longer uh, considered suitable for use of pr production of power. And so at that point, that's when we then uh, move it into our, uh, our wet storage system. The spent fuel pools are uh, founded in rock and in turn uh, are comprised of uh, walls that are heavily reinforced concrete that are four to six feet thick and in turn have a stainless steel liner. If you look at the photo, the photo shows a grid type structure in the pool. Those are the spent fuel pool racks that uh, each one of those squares accommodates one single fuel assembly. There's uh, been a lot of questions from the public through time as to the, the design and licensing of the racking for the spent fuel pools. What I wanted to note was that uh, during the original design of Diablo and most other nuclear facilities, the uh, design was premised on the fact that the uh, federal government would routinely collect spent nuclear fuel for reprocessing. So as such, it um, was the original design that you would just simply limit the amount of uh, racking configurations that you provided in the pool. So at that point, we, we provided, along with most other nuclear plants, enough racking capacity for about one and a half cores in the pool. Uh, before we went commercial, the late 1970s, the uh, Carter administration 
uh, stopped the reprocessing programs. And so as such, in 1982, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act was passed, whereby it mandated that the uh, Department of Energy assume responsibility for spent nuclear fuel, and in turn, develop a federal repository. So that was prior to Diablo's initial operation. So at that point, we understood that uh, we needed to be able to provide enough storage capacity in our pools to be able to accommodate time for Department of Energy to be able to develop their storage program. So as such, Diablo Canyon, before we went commercial operation, went ahead and uh, developed a, a new racking program for the pools that uh, considered the uh, appropriate thermal effects of additional fuel, as well as the, uh, the shielding requirements and dose requirements associated with uh, more fuel in the pool. And as such, I uh, ended up with the configurations that we have today. As time progressed, it became clear that um, Yucca Mountain was not going to be completed on time. And so, as such, Diablo, as well as other plants, had to make decisions as to what were the appropriate steps going forward, whether or not we would uh, re-rack the pools with a higher density rack, or be able to look at being able to prepare the fuel to be able to be <coughs> transported to a federal repository in the, in the future. So in the 1999-2000 timeframe, PG&E made the decision to not re-rack the pools further, but to proceed with the development of a dry cast storage program. With our uh, dry cast storage program, that um, we went through and looked at um, what was the appropriate um, size of a facility to develop, and felt that uh, it was appropriate to develop a facility that could accommodate all the fuel that would be discharged from the Apple Canyon, both units, for the 40-year license life. And as such, then proceeded with the, um, the licensing, permitting, and the eventual development of a facility that uh, would accommodate all that fuel. The photo that you see here shows the dry cast storage system that we selected. It's from Holtec International. Uh, it's comprised of uh, a First, a multi-purpose canister that's utilized to be able to uh, package fuel for interim storage in a facility such as this, and then also for ultimate transportation to a federal repository or for reprocessing if the, uh, if the country ever goes back to uh, the premise of reprocessing. That multi-purpose canister is constructed out of stainless steel, very uh, stable material. It's filled with helium gas, a nice inert environment inside that cask, and they're fully s welded shut, so a nice sealed package. That multi-purpose canister is then stored in the storage overpacks that you see in the photo. Storage overpacks are um, approximately, when loaded, about 340,000 pounds each. So very heavy, very robust. They're constructed out of two steel vessels, an inner vessel and an outer vessel, each one inch thick steel with 28 inches of uh, high density concrete between the two to provide additional shielding and protection for those multi-purpose canisters for extreme events, be it tornadoes, earthquakes, or other um, scenarios that are, uh, are part of our design basis. Our facility is different than all other nuclear spent fuel storage facilities in that um, in consideration of our high seismic region, that uh, we went through and uh, decided to anchor our cast to the foundation. And in order to be able to accommodate that, uh, that meant that we'd had to develop a large embed type structure under each one of the casks to be able to uh, transfer those high seismic loads into the foundation. And as such, that foundation ended up being eight feet thick, so quite a heavy mass. So this is a photo of our storage facility. Uh, as I noted earlier, we licensed it and permitted it to be able to accommodate all fuel discharge for the 40 years. That's 138 cask. When we uh, performed the initial construction, we elected to construct two out of seven foundations. So initial capabilities of being able to store 38 casks instead of the 138. That was all based on the premise that uh, Yucca Mountain would continue as modified as the modified schedule predicted and that uh, as such we were uh, uh, under the belief that uh, we'd be able to uh, move fuel off-site prior to uh, the need to be able to expand to additional foundations 
with uh, Yucca Mountain, essentially um, a chapter that's been closed in our history today, that uh, it's, it's very evident that uh, we needed to proceed forth with development of the other five foundations. <coughs> so today, uh, our schedule shows that uh, we brought a new uh, batch plant in. We've let a contract for expanding the SOC to granite construction. And uh, in 2014, we'll focus this year on uh, being able to expand and put the other five foundations in place. What that does then is that puts us into a cycle of being able to uh, get back into loading campaigns in the 2015 time frame. What this curve is, is it's a, it's a little complicated with uh, all the squiggles to it. But what I'm trying to show with this is that um, the, the amount of fuel in the pools through time, showing that um, as we continue to operate and went through our first a uh, number of refueling outages in Unit 1 that the amount of fuel in the pools continue to accumulate. This is assuming there's no license renewal. Am I correct? Uh, that, that's correct. This is showing that um, what our current plans look like without license renewal factored in. But, but the, right up, the pink line Please. looks like it's today. Sorry. The pink line is today, and the, today that's fact. That's correct. Right. Yeah, so what you see Everything is... You, to the right is a projection. That's correct. Anything right. past the, the little vertical line that you right. see that goes... A projection. Uh, that's a projection. Mm -hmm. So with this, uh, the top line that you see with the little um, step up, that was uh, the installations of the temporary rack that we had to put in both Unit 1 and Unit 2 pools to be able to provide enough capacity for full core offload while we continue to uh, license and develop the uh, storage facility. Mm -hmm. From there, then, uh, we've made progress through time of moving spent fuel out of wet storage into dry cast storage. To date, we have uh, approximately one-third of our fuel from both units now in dry cast storage. So that leaves us in a position at the moment of having one-third of our fuel in the unit one spent fuel pools, one-third in unit two, and one-third in uh, dry cast storage. In 2015, in 2016, we'll proceed with uh, loading campaigns, whereby in 15, we'll, um, we'll load nine cask, and 16, we'll load 11 cask. And what that will do is that uh, by 2016, it'll put us in a position to where we've reached the minimum required levels of fuel in our pools to be able to be in compliance with uh, commitments to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission associated with orders such as B5 Bravo. From there, then we have an orchestrated plan that we will continue on a every other year basis to be able to remove fuel from both Unit 1 and Unit 2 pools. So with that, then uh, what I'd like to do is um, Open it up to questions. I'm sure that uh, you have quite a few, and I know the public behind me does. Yes, sir. I just have one clarification of fact. The policy uh, at the federal level to abandon reprocessing occurred in the Ford administration, not in the Carter administration. It occurred about a month before the election in 1976. Ford announced it as a presidential um, position, and then Carter re reinforced it when he came in, just so people remember um, where it came from. That's just a, a little thing. That doesn't affect anything else, but I just want to be sure that get that fact straight, and I'm as sure of that as I'm sitting here because I lived through it. Thank you um, for the clarification. Sure, sure. That's a small point. Um, the question that we asked, which has remained unanswered here, is um, what well, I could paraphrase it as, what would the fastest campaign of moving things from there to there look like if, if, if you could do the fastest you could? And I understand that your answer is predicated on the minimum cold assembly issue. Th that's correct. Right. But I don't know whether that minimum cold assembly issue is something that could be modified through either analysis or maybe the analysis is conservative rather than realistic or some other um, uh, other changes. I just don't know. And, uh, and I'm asking that question. We asked it, but I'll, I'll ask it. Because that is the, that's a paraphrase of the question that we asked earlier and which 
in fact, was uh, in, in, in our, our finding or our recommendation in the annual report for this last year. So can you, can you talk to, to, to what, what that constraint really, where it arose and, and what might be done, or is there anything to, to be done? Sure, I can speak to that. That uh, word arose was under orders from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission yes, associated with B5 Bravo. Right. That uh, checkerboarding, you probably yeah. heard that as a, a, as a, a method that she utilized. <coughs> so what was required uh, or committed to by Diablo and uh, other, plants. other plants was that uh, we would uh, maintain the ability to be able to put a cold assembly on each side of an assembly that was freshly released right. from the reactor. Just the checkerboard with black and red, you might think. So they're all, yeah. So, so what that meant then is that uh, with 193 fuel assemblies in a reactor, that you had to be able to maintain the ability to be able to um, put an assembly on each side of 193. So that's how you got to the uh, the minimum numbers that are shown there. Yeah, I understand that. So, and, and that, that arises willy-nilly from that requirement. But I don't understand whether the technical basis for that requirement could be, the technical basis or the objective could be achieved a different way, in which case more could be moved. That is, the reason for that was, by the way, for people that don't know what B5 what Bravo, B Bravo is, it was a, 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 a Nuclear Regulatory Commission requirement after the attacks at, at, on September 11, 20, uh, 2001 in which the um, facilities all around, and not just you, everybody, were required to take certain measures to assure a safety in the event of, uh, of, of a very large, um, some very large events like, like the sort of attack that you could have imagined had they hit Diablo instead of the World Trade Center or something like that. I mean, I, there, there's more detail to it, but that's sort of impressive. It. And I understand that. But I'd like to ask, and maybe you don't know the answer and you have to go back and do analysis, but is there some other way to achieve the objectives of that that would still enable more fuel to be transferred more rapidly? And I think that's a, a good industry-wide question to ask. Yeah, well, I ask a diablo. <laughs> in that uh, to be able to look at uh, whether or not um, additional thermal analysis could be performed to be able to look at uh, the differences between utilizing an older fuel assembly to function like a, a radiator in the uh, scenarios that are postulated under B5 Bravo uh, as compared to the uh, efficiency and effectiveness of having air uh, between fuel assemblies. And so, um, yeah, it, it's a question I think that, uh, that could be posed and that uh, analysis would uh, answer that question as to whether or not there would be the uh, potential opportunity to be able to uh, deviate from what is currently a commitment before the oh, but, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. But you see, I have a different scheme, and this is your boy inventor, and I don't mean this deadly serious, but I'm going to say it. Suppose I could sell you something that looks like a fuel assembly in terms of its mass, but isn't a fuel assembly, but performs that thermal function, and I could sell it to you for 100 bucks. And you could put it in all those spaces where the black ones were instead of the red ones, and you could take all that other stuff out. <laughs> it's not a joke, oh, although it's partially oh. a joke, are there other ways to accomplish that thermal function besides having 20-year-old fuel perform that thermal function that wouldn't cost much compared to the benefit? I don't know the answer, although I have an idea that maybe that would be worth looking at. And I'm not the first one that's raised this, and I'm not the 44th one that's raised it either. Yeah. But I don't know the answer. I, I think it's a great question. Okay. And that um, I think it, uh, you know, it does uh, uh, bear the need to be able to investigate it further. All right, and then there's a second question which you mentioned, I'll mention for you. Uh, I, I can't remember, two years ago, looked at the analysis that supports this need for the thermal uh, function that those dead fuel assemblies perform because they're, they're, they're not generating any heat to speak of and yet they perform this thermal inertia function, which is important, I understand it. But when I looked at that analysis, it didn't seem to me that it was as completely physically as realistic as it could be because of certain conservatisms that you were required to make. I, I don't know whether you've revisited that. For example, and it's easy to say, if you know the thermal history of all those different things, there may be some extra margin there that you can take credit for that would enable you to do better. Okay, and in, in, in the actual array, you're, as I understood it, required to assume that the, that the hot ones have a certain 
thermal oh. load right. whose value may be conservative in order to get on with the analysis without having to do each one separately. Right, depending on how long it's been on the reactor core, whether it's a or, one first cycle, second cycle, or, or third where it cycle. was in the core. Or where it was in the core, I mean, that's the, correct. Because, the, because the, 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 the neutron radiation history and therefore the thermal history of those are all different, and you know that. Right. I mean, of all the people in this at this plant that know that, Gerald knows that, I know you know that. So I just don't have any idea how much, whether there's much to be gained there or not. You know, if you're going to say, well, we'll do all that special stuff, and when we sharpen our pencil, we're going to be take seven assemblies out of there or something, you know, something out of hundreds and hundreds, it doesn't make any difference. That's one thing. But maybe it's a substantial difference. Yeah, and, and to be forthright, I, I really don't know without uh, seeing a set of analysis performed to do a, you know, a, de a detailed set of thermal analysis that you would contract with a company like Holtec International to take their design of their rack systems and go through and do a, uh, a revised thermal analysis um, with a series of set assumptions that um, yeah, give you other flexibility and other options. See, now, just to say, I'm not convinced that the safety benefit is enormous, but it is surely positive. That is, it is surely positive. And furthermore, and public make this all the time, and I'm going to make it for them, there's something to be said for defense in depth that instead of having just a couple of pools, you've got all these, you, know, I mean, you can finish that for me. And that's a value quite separate from the rest of the analysis, which is worth honoring, you know, in some decision. But you can't make that decision until you know the analysis, which I just described. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that um, both systems are safe, wet and dry storage. But uh, well, I can accept that. But they're, but one's safer than the other, and so it's worth examining this. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, I just simply note that um, uh, I'm definitely a proponent of dry cast storage. That after spending 11 years of my that. career on it, that uh, uh, I would like to you know, continue to see us make progress. That's why I'm happy to see that we are going to be loading 20 additional casks in the next two years after this expansion. So that, that's a lot of fuel that gets moved considering that one third of the fuel in our pools, uh, that was in our pools, um, is now stored in 29 casks. So an additional 20 casks makes a big difference. The other aspect of that is that you start looking at uh, timelines for being able to acquire additional cask in, is that it takes uh, two, two and a half years that uh, companies like Holtec uh, have a finite number of casks that they can produce and, in a period of time, which they're there. running about uh, nine casks per month right you're now. Not is their only, you're not their only. And, their business continues to expand, so we, we are trying to stay ahead of the curve and make sure that uh, we get as many casks as quickly as we can from them. Uh, if you look up at, past the uh, ISFACI at this point, we have the cask already on site for the 2015 loading campaign, and that uh, the basis for getting them now on site this early was simply because we could take and grab that spot in the queue and be able to get the cask here. So it is important to us to manage that timeline. Other questions? Uh, a point of, <clears throat> this is the right time for me to make a point of disclosure. As you well know, Mr. Strickland, uh, you and I gone back <laughs> to the very first day of this dry cast storage facility being licensed for the uh, members of the public who may not know this. I happen to sit on the licensing board that approved the license that's required for the uh, dry cast storage system for this facility. Way back. And I, way back, and I, and, I, and I also happen to have written the unanimous decision uh, on uh, affirming the safety uh, uh, principle that has been used in manufacturing, uh, designing, and installing uh, of the CAS system here at this facility. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Public? Thank you very much, Gerald. Uh, at point. this point on our agenda, it's time for any additional public comments related to presentations that we've heard from PG&E. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. John Giesman on behalf of the Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility. I am a longtime admirer of Gerald Strickland. Uh, 
But I think what I said to Dr. Lamb earlier today with respect to PG&E's response uh, is still largely true. Uh, I think their response to the recommendation in your report remains unresponsive. They have not provided an estimate of the annual rate that would accomplish the objective mm. of uh, an acceleration right. of the transfer. So, or, or technically answering the sort of questions I was just posing. Correct. Uh, I will say uh, that, uh, as I indicated this afternoon, they might change their numbers in this evening's presentation, and they did. They've bumped up the uh, number of casks they expect to load uh, by several uh, compared to mm -hmm. what they told uh, the NRC inspector in April of 2013 right. yeah. and compared to what Mr. Halpin uh, testified to uh, at the CPUC in August of 2013 uh, and compared to what Mr. Sharp uh, testified to uh, in, I believe, November of 2013. Uh, using the numbers that I previously been led to believe were accurate and now should be adjusted by only a few, at their current pace, the first two pads will reach capacity by 2017, but the trajectory thereafter will barely exceed one additional pad's worth of capacity by 2025. This casual pace would leave 73 of the potential 138 casks undeployed and more than half of the concrete pad capacity unutilized in 2025. And based on what Mr. Strickland said, I think the number 73 probably ought to be bumped up four or five or six. A, very, a small number, though. A, a small few, number. A uh, now, with respect to the concerns that, that Dr. Bundit's raised, and this is not my area of expertise by a long shot, but it would occur to me that uh, the uh, heat loading of new casks would be something that uh, could be uh, changed by license amendment. You mean of the casks? Not of, the, of the dry casks oh, okay. themselves. Go ahead. Hmm. Southern California Edison uh, testified uh, before the PUC uh, in November that that's what they are doing. Uh, and they are doing that in order to accommodate uh, higher burn-up fuel. Uh, so they expect to be able to reduce that cooling off period from what has variously been estimated be 7 or 10 or 12 or perhaps as long as 15 years. PG&E apparently is of the same mind. Uh, they have a license amendment uh, pending uh, with the NRC, and in their March 14th, 2013 letter to the NRC, identified PG&E letter DIL-13-004, they respond to a variety of NRC questions uh, about their application, and consistently throughout their response, they indicate a cooling period of five years as their baseline assumption. That's the minute, yeah. So uh, I think there are a variety of ways that can be used potentially to skin this cat, but the first requirement is the will to do so. I think what you've heard in the very diplomatic terms from Mr. Strickland uh, and in the less diplomatic written response to your report's recommendation is we don't have to do this, we don't want to do this, and you can't make us do this. So I would repeat the recommendation I made to you earlier this afternoon, and which I believe is consistent with your annual report. Make them comply with the recommendation the California Energy Commission has made consistently every IEPR since 2008 to accelerate the transfer as rapidly as possible, consistent with all NRC regulations. Thank you. Uh, any additional public comment on these presentations? 
before we move in to address some of the so, questions? So I want okay. to answer some. So let's, let's start with any comments and then um, we may ask also so Gerald Strickland for help. As I understand the definition of high, high burn up fuel that's commonly used elsewhere, they've never put any in there and they don't have any. Okay, that's my understanding. Uh, but of course, but, but of course it depends. Uh, when I was starting in this business, high burn up fuel was only half as much, I mean, the, the burn up of the fuel they were using was only half as much as they're using now or even less. And what they're using, what everybody's using now would have been considered high, so it, so it changes. Uh, but uh, maybe Gerald um, can respond to that. All right. Actually, uh, let's well, no, go ahead and uh, go ahead, Peter. Uh, let's let's complete because I, I also have a couple of comments. Right, right. I, I had a, a specific comment in response to Mr. Giesman's remark. Uh, I am very sympathetic to Mr. Giesman's approach. I think the I don't think the committee is it's in the position to compel any compliance uh, of, of PG&E. However, I do think I do think my view is the committee should continue to request an evaluation of under what circumstances PG&E would be able to accelerate or, or just to come up with a limiting uh, analysis of what it's the real capacity to move spend fuel. I mean, that, that's a, an inquiry, it's, it's not a command. Uh, my personal view with the, the committee would, would perhaps take action on, on responding to PG&E's respond to our recommendation. So I have another comment, this has to do with, um, I was proposing this scheme that I haven't really thought through about, gee, we'll sharpen our pencil and we'll get some of that stuff, some of the cold stuff out of there. But it isn't going to make anything any safer to take 23-year-old stuff and put it in those dry casts. What I want them to take out of there is seven and eight-year-old stuff that's, that, that is past the five years but is still young. Because that's the stuff where there is whatever extra hazard there is, that's what it is. It's not the 27-year-old stuff or whatever, whatever wherever the oldest stuff is that's out there. I, mean, I think it's worth clarifying that. To do that doesn't produce much extra because the hazard in those pools is the young stuff. I want to be sure people yeah. clarify that. Right? that that's okay. what I would think. So I'll add my uh, thoughts on this, which differ slightly. Um, Go ahead. The, the, first, the first key element is this um, uh, requirement uh, by NRC to have sufficient number of old fuel elements available to place one next to each of the uh, uh, freshly offloaded fuel elements in a pool which gives you this number of 772 being required. If one accepts that requirement, because there may be other ways to achieve this, but this is, this is what's accepted uh, as being the minimum, then given the presentation from Mr. Strickland showing changes in inventory reaching in 2016, as the letter says, this number of 772 off by slightly because I assume that it assume, you, know, you, you have integer numbers associated with the cask. I, I mean, I, I think that, that I can do the math pretty easily and figure out how much they're proposing to move. And furthermore, because they have to build the pad in this coming year, I think it's reasonable that they are probably, this is the most rapid trajectory that could be achieved uh, to to reach uh, this number of 772 and therefore their commitment to be there in 2016 uh, represents the fastest rate at which the goal of reaching this minimum threshold could be achieved. For that reason, I think they've been responsive to the specific question that we pose to them. We probably need to now begin to look about at the question of is 772 the right number? Um, but my conclusion is that to the specific question that they've asked, if I look at this graph, I can do the math and I, I would feel a little bit strange about asking them to come back and actually say, well, here's the number, here's the number of casts. This, this planned reduction reaching the number in 2016 is about the fastest it could be done and that's what PG&E is committed to do because they also have to build more dry cast storage space. 
I think we have a, a lot of additional issues uh, to address, but and, and I, I'd also be curious to get Mr. Strickland's um, comments on this. As best I can tell, the combination of this presentation and this answer is 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 responsive to the specific recommendation that we have, and we need to figure out what our next step is uh, with respect to to this longer term trajectory uh, post 2016. So, I, so let's have a dialogue here. Look, I asked two different questions here. The one was stipulate what I'm willing. For the, for the purpose of the first one, I was willing to stipulate that the 772 is, is a firm number. But then maybe there's some way we can sharpen our pencil because the actual burn-ups are different. And you, you know, I said that. Now, I'm not sure how much leverage there is there. The second one was to challenge whether or not you can achieve the B5, the, the, you know, the B5B policy objective without doing it this way, all right? And then you go back to the NRC and say, your policy objective is something we endorse. After all, none of us wants to have a vulnerability to terrorism that, or other events like that that would be in, increased because we did something like this. But maybe we can achieve that policy objective without this, without, without this way. And I think both are worth looking at. And then, when you're done, you may do a risk analysis and decide there isn't much risk benefit anyway. In which case, which hasn't been done here, because as we learned, the, 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 the staff and the ACRS thing excludes seismic in the West. So somebody has to do that. And then you can go and see if there's a risk benefit. Right. Surely there is a risk benefit. Is it a small or a large one? I don't the, know whether it's the, large. The only, the only other thing I would note at this point, which, which would lead me to the conclusion that we can probably close out this recommendation but follow closely this area, is that PG&E is committed to completing all of the pads. And the rate of the rate of reduction in inventory through 2016 is about as fast as they can reasonably achieve anyhow. Well, given all the so, constraints, that's probably right. So the major questions are post 2016. What's the correct policy going forward from there? Right. Right. Now, now, if if I understand now. Mr. Giesman's remark earlier correctly, he is saying this table that was presented to us tonight is different. Oh, yes. Than what the PG&E yes, is. official but response is. You sure it is, and it's slightly different. Right, right. Given that difference exists. No, it's, it's 2016. It, it, they're, both, they're both down to what they say, 772 by 2016. So I think sure. that the, the response here is consistent with the, with the graph. I'm not arguing that, uh, okay. Peter. Let's, I let's, just think it's, quali it's, it's quantitatively different, but not qualitatively. Yeah. Let's, let's go ahead and pause discussion, uh, uh, entertain additional no, public Joe, comment, no, and, then, Joe and then Gerald Strickland. Joe was going to respond. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Gerald. <laughs> I did, sorry. Uh, no problem. I, I Thank have you. to apologize for putting you on the spot. That's what we're here for. The, the, uh, Dr. Giesman was correct in that uh, the uh, tables that were uh, cited earlier um, did have different numbers, yeah. and that uh, we've gone back and uh, in turn sharpened the pencils to see what we can do to be able to drive down uh, the numbers to the minimum numbers by 2016. So that, that did add uh, several casts to That's our right. loading campaigns. Mm -hmm. And um, in turn, high burn up fuel, 45 gigawatt days per metric ton of uranium. That's the standard definition that is in our license with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. That I believe it was around the third uh, refueling outage that uh, we then started uh, lengthening the uh, duration of our uh, operation cycles, which then uh, put us into higher burn-up fuel. Mm -hmm. So the majority of the fuel that we do have is higher burn-up fuel. Based on that definition? Yes, based on the definition of 45 uh, gigawatt days per metric ton of uranium. Okay. Also, uh, you look at the storage system that we use, that uh, we use what's called regionalized storage, where we have 32 fuel assemblies and a multi-purpose canister. And we purposely set it up such that we have the younger fuel that's placed in the center of the cask. Absolutely. And then we put older fuel yes, around the perimeter to be able to function both for shielding purposes and for heat transfer purposes. Right. And so it's a very effective way of uh, balancing the amount of younger fuel that we put into dry storage versus older fuel. With this license amendment that uh, was just referenced, um, what it'll do also is uh, give us the ability to be able to uh, load higher burn up fuels that uh, when our we issued, when we applied for our initial license, in, or, in order to be able to um, uh, 
get the license in a timely manner, we limited our loading capabilities to low burn-up fuel. And so with that, then, um, after our first loading campaign, then it became important that uh, we then have the ability to load higher burn-up fuel. So we, we processed one license amendment to bump the levels up uh, to a specific level. Now Holtex continued to refine their analysis and design their CAS systems, like most of the other storage uh, companies. And as such, we're going to take advantage of uh, being able to load even higher burn-up fuels to be able to then shorten that, that length of time down for being able to move fuel from wet to dry storage. Okay. Now, um, uh, Mrs. Shakley, if I may suggest, now, we only see table, the table here for unit one. I understand. Right. Would it be possible if you would provide another table for unit two so that the response, the pg and &E response to the committee's second recommendation would be more complete? Oh, that's a good point. Very uh, that's a good point. I, sure. That uh, the whole premise was that uh, we'd be down to the minimum levels in both pools. Uh, I only generated I a table for right. one, but uh, if you want to take an action item for me, then uh, what I'll do is I'll uh, generate a, a second curve for unit two. It does look very different. It's very, very similar to that, but uh, what it, it'll do is it'll illustrate that we're following the same curves. Right. It would be helpful if, if somehow uh, that correspondence be uh, given to us, indicating this would be a supplemental response to the committee's recommendation number two. I think that, that, would, that would allow us to close it out. Addition, uh, basically, additional uh, information related to, and then, then I think at that point, given that information, we we could close out this. Although I, we'll, we should we should get additional public comment as well before making any final decision. But uh, 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 that this is this this whole area post 2016 uh, remains something that we're going to have to continue to look at. Thank you. Very briefly, I wanted to, and John Giesman on behalf of the Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility, I wanted to recommend to you uh, for evaluating that post-2016 uh, lowest minimum or pace of transfer, uh, the Southern California Edison uh, San Onofre uh, Irradiated Fuel Management Plan. Mm -hmm. I believe they've completed That's it by point. now. I understand it will be made a part of the public decommissioning plan that they submit to the NRC in June, mm -hmm. uh, right. and I would suggest to you that that is probably the best benchmark to evaluate PG&E's performance against. Um, just briefly, I'd note that that most likely I would expect that it won't it won't end up applying in this case because that's the trajectory that you get here in 2027 or so when you're no longer having any fresh fuel being generated and therefore you no longer have this requirement to maintain a minimum number. But that said, I think it's important for us to review because there will be other additional information also, uh, the Southern California uh, Edison study, and uh, I would put that as an action for us uh, to, to do so. Yeah, in fact, I, I think it's worth saying to the public that this figure that I'm looking at predicates on, predicated on a 40-year license and it ends. Right, mm -hmm. but um, we don't know whether that's going to be, and nobody that's prudently thinking about the future should say that the probability that the plant's going to end at the 40-year license is 100 percent. We don't know. Yet it's still a proceeding before the NRC that we just can't can't know. So I think you got to think you got got to think about this with both of those scenarios in mind. One in which it ends, and the other in which it gets 20 more years, and there's got a heck of a lot more fuel out there. <laughs> <laughs> John Giesman on behalf of the Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility again. Uh, when Dr. Budnitz says probability, uh, I always sit up and pay attention. Uh, and I do think that by California standards, this rapidly aging plant is approaching the end of its actuarial survivorship projection. Think about what percentage of license life expectancy each of California's other seven reactors actually achieved. Santa Susana, 17 percent. Valacitos, 30 percent. Sure. Humboldt Bay, 32 percent. Rancho Seco, 35 percent. San Onofre Unit 1, 62 percent. San Onofre Unit 2, 71 percent. San Onofre Unit 3, 70 percent. Diablo Unit 1 is already at 73 percent. Unit 2 is at 71. 
Dr. Budnitz knows me to be a big believer in probabilistic <laughs> seismic hazard evaluation. There's no reason why we shouldn't apply the same standards I, to license expectancy. I'm going to say something that I think you know perfectly well, all right? If I applied actuarial <laughs> statistics to myself and my wife, we would be spending everything fast because the actuary says we're not going to live to be 90. Uh, well, but yep. we're saving because we think we might. <laughs> and I don't think that either course is necessarily imprudent. At, it seems to me that you ought to do analysis with some at, other at, things in mind. At this point, at this point, um, I, I would ask, uh, Gerald, uh, do you have any additional comments to make at this point? So we have actions for PG&E to provide additional information. That is the plot, the similar plot, uh, with with projections for spent fuel unloading for uh, uh, Unit 2 as well. I would just also note that I do commend PG&E for making the decision to build out the rest of the pads this coming year and to, to launch an accelerated, at least over the next year or so, effort to move spent fuel into pools, uh, because that, that, that puts the plant on a trajectory towards having a larger amount of its fuel out of the pools and in dry storage. And that, that indisputably does make the plant safer. The debates may be about how much, but it is definitely going to make the plant safer. Furthermore, I believe that you'll be able to recover all of these costs out of the federal government in the end anyhow, so the taxpayers can pick up this bill. Do we have any additional comments from members uh, or consultants? Okay. At this point, I'd like to call this evening's session of the Diablo Canyon Independent Safety Committee to a close. We will reconvene in the morning. The topics in the morning will be interesting. The very first thing that we're going to be covering at 8, starting at 8.30, will be the seismic safety action plan for personnel, which is everybody has heard repeatedly in our public meetings is something that we believe is extraordinarily important and that will be the first item on our agenda at 8.30 in the morning. At this point, I can call this evening session to a close. Thank you for coming and thank you for those who are online for listening.